Dr. Lear, it's a pleasure to have you with us this evening. Well, it's an absolute uh, pleasure of mine to be here with you, and I thank Jordan so much for inviting me to uh, participate in the program. Well, Dr. Roger Lear, spell L-E-I-R, correct? Uh, that is correct, sir. Okay, Dr. Roger Lear is world famous for being the implant doctor, a well, doctor who actually, in fact, uh, takes implants, alien implants, out of humans. And that's an extraordinary story that uh, scientists all over the world are saying, well, if there's anything to this alien uh, UFO subject, uh, uh, we, we're scientists, we'd like to see some hard evidence. That is not true. That's a lie on the face of it. Because there's so much evidence out there that government already knows and that scientists already know, but they are they are playing a game with the uh, with the people, acting as if they, they've never heard any of this and it's all a bunch of nonsense. Well, Doctor Lear is one one man who has been taking alien implants, little small metallic uh, implants, out of people's bodies, out of their arm or leg or foot, um, and it's it's an extraordinary story that these things are in your human body. And you don't see them. You don't feel them. The body doesn't even know they're there. And yet they are beeping some kind of a, uh, of a, uh, of a frequency. It's, a, it's an incredible story about how the aliens who are here are able to put within humans little metal uh, detectors of some kind. We'll do let doctor explain it. But they put it inside your body, connect it to your nerve endings, and your body is the battery which runs these little electrical uh, devices that's put into humans. And you don't even know they're there because the body doesn't see it. And there's no outside scar tissue showing that somebody has put something in your body. So it's an extraordinary story. It's about time somebody, scientific world, look at this because we, you know, it's, it's there. So if you're interested in what aliens are doing with humans, well, here's one thing they're doing. They're putting alien implants into human people, and Dr. Lear is taking some of them out. So with that, I want to uh, welcome Dr. Lear because well, I've known him for many years and uh, he's got lots and lots of stories, a lot of very important stories. But this particular subject we'll start off with, what is an alien implant? And, and, and how do people find them? How do people even know that they're in the body? Well, Jordan, you uh, summed up quite nicely what it is that uh, I do. We've made some uh, astounding new findings uh, within the last few months that have shed new light on this. But in essence, uh, they are objects, uh, mainly metallic, uh, wrapped with a uh, biological coating, which becomes um, integrated uh, with the uh, tissue of the body and then uh, connects itself with uh, a large amount of uh, inappropriate nerve cells called proprioceptors. And these are in places uh, where they're not uh, normally found. Uh, now, uh, as, fact, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, what, what they do, uh, we're just beginning to uh, scratch the surface and learn about uh, how they function. Now, uh, as you mentioned, uh, we find some of these uh, larger objects, and we have, we've done 16 cases now and produced 17 objects. We have about seven of them that if you uh, lined up one right after the other, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. They look all the same. Now, uh, the individuals that we do uh, must uh, conform to a set of uh, strict criteria and protocols as to background. In other words, we just can't have someone come in and say, well, uh, gee, I think I got something in my arm and I want it removed. Uh, well, that that doesn't work because we have to do, we do a thorough investigation of the individual. They have to have some kind of a conscious memory or experience that will verify the possibility that they have had contact with uh, non-terrestrial beings. So um, we send them uh, a package of forms. Uh, once we receive conclusive evidence that uh, there is an object there, and by conclusive evidence, I'm talking about an X-ray or a CAT scan. 
uh, once we receive that material, uh, it's looked at by our radiologists, and we receive a, a report that tells us what kind of an object it is and where it's located. Now, we've uh, formed uh, a 501c3 nonprofit organization called A&S Research. Uh, no individual that we've operated on has any expenditure whatsoever. This is purely to gain scientific data, and there's no charges made uh, to the patients. And we, even if they're covered by insurance, we don't use it. Most of our income comes from uh, donations uh, from the outside. And there's been some uh, very kind individuals that uh, have donated the money so far to uh, make some good uh, progressive uh, results. So that's, that's how we carry on. Uh, once we're convinced that the object is there, we send them a package or a questionnaire which uh, has uh, a portion of it which can actually be graded. And we can tell what the percentage of possibility or probability is that they are involved. If it's a high percentage, then they become, at that time, a candidate for a possible surgical extraction. Then uh, the next thing is it's up to them because we advise uh, abductees that if they if we do find an object and the object is there and it's verified, do they really want to know more? So they have to kind of <clears throat> search their soul because they may have gone through 30, 40, 50 years of having it there and perhaps uh, taking it out uh, might have some uh, <clears throat> effect uh, on them both psychologically and physiologically that might make them worse as far as life is concerned. So the ultimate decision is uh, really up to the client. Yeah, Dr. Leary, I have a couple quick questions. You mentioned in all cases that these uh, devices, if you line them up, they all look the same. Are they about the size of a kernel of rice, or what's the size and uh, your data? Are these a little microprocessing component of some sort? Okay, uh, well, uh, being we uh, uh, jump to that part, well, uh, let me give you a little morphological description. Uh, they run about uh, 6 to 10 millimeters in length and are about as uh, thick as a pencil lead. And then, as I said, they are wrapped with a very uh, shiny coating that you can't cut through with a surgical blade. <laughs> now, one of the objects that we um, uh, looked at, uh, we couldn't cut it with a pair of dikes. So we took it to a machine shop, and prior to the time they tried to cut it, <clears throat> they used a very fine, uh, sharp file that can make a groove in any known metal. There was no groove made in this object. So they were, they were stupefied, didn't know what to do. And at that point, we had to get into the inside of the object to see what it was. So... Um, Again, that's kind of jumping ahead a little bit because when we study these objects, we study them in a scientific manner, and that's usually from the outside in. So we find out as much as we can about the outside, and then you have to start sacrificing the object by cutting it and seeing what's on the inside. So we do all the, the testing, for example, electron microscopy, uh, we do uh, a number of other uh, tests, which I won't get into because they're very scientific and technical, to try and find out as much as we can. Then we go on the inside and we look and see what it's made of. So the object that wouldn't cut, we actually had to take it to a laser laboratory. And the, when we told uh, the technician what we had, uh, he put the uh, laser on uh, automatic, and he said he virtually ran off into the corner because he didn't know what was going to happen. But the object was cut with the laser, and then when we looked under it uh, with the high magnification through the electron microscope, we could even see the edges where it had been cut. So I guess the next question is, uh, what do we find? Well, these are devices that represent an extremely advanced form of nanotechnology. Uh, about seven or eight years ago, uh, science was arguing whether there could be uh, the existence of carbon nanotubes. And most of them argued that there was none in nature and that they were so complex that they couldn't even be built. But now we know there's none in nature, 
but they can be built. This is what we're just learning. So as the time goes by, the equipment for studying these things begins to change because now carbon nanotechnology is in the hands of major industry. For example, they're talking about building a space tower. They are the strongest <laughs> material known to man. So if we built a space tower that went a mile high, you could launch a, a rocket from there and you would save a tremendous amount of money and fuel because you're not defe defeating the gravity of the surface of the planet. Japan is working with these things to try and weave them into a fiber, and then they will make clothing out of them. So at the flip of a switch, a woman can be wearing a blue dress, a printed dress, a red dress, and it'll not only keep you uh, warm in the winter, but it'll keep you cool in the summer. So this, this is technology which is going on now. So the machinery that we have, so to speak, scientifically to detect carbon nanotechnology is there. So when we look in these objects, and one was 46 years old, 46 years old, we're getting back to you know, almost the 60 years of Roswell. We know that we couldn't have back developed anything you know, in that period of time. It would be impossible 46 years ago. <laughs> that predates almost the black budget. But we find that when we look at the single or multiple walled carbon nanotubes, they've been put together into carbon nano strands. And that looks, in other words, if you look at them through the electron microscope, you see they look like wiring. And then they put carbon nano strands together in a woven pattern, and you get what's called a carbon nano bundle. So this is like a cable. Then we find structures, for example, which are called orthorhombic crystals. And these are rectangular crystals of varying size. And uh, if I can take uh, our audience back to the days <laughs> where they probably don't remember the origin of radio, which we're on right now, uh, we got our radio signals through a crystal set, which was a crystal and a copper coil, and a battery, and an earphone, and you actually got a radio program. But still, till this day, the best and the finest crystallographers on the face of the earth do not know what goes on inside a crystal to make it change or carry a frequency. So here we have carbon nanotechnology, connected to crystals, and then we find other things. For, for example, we find uh, gold balls, which we don't know what they do. Uh, we find ovoids of various metals. Now, we also recently, very recently, found an opening in one of these objects that is the size of one atom. And because of its size, we couldn't look down deep enough with the electron microscope to see what's in that aperture. Uh, the next telling thing is what are the elements that are in these objects? Uh, we find what are called non-terrestrial isotopic ratios. And what is that? Sounds complex, but not really, because we know that if you want to make an atomic bomb, everybody knows what U-235 is. <laughs> and that's uranium-235. Uh, 235 represents the number of neutrons and protons that are in the nucleus of that particular atom. But the uranium atom, when you when you mine it on Earth, has U-235, U-234, U-236, and so on. But there's a ratio of one to the other. <laughs> if we mine, for example, uranium and it came from the moon, the element would be uranium, but the ratios of these isotopes would be different. So <laughs> if we knew where it came from, we could say it's not only extraterrestrial, but it came from the moon. So that's how we look at some of the, the moon rocks and are able to tell they came from the moon. If we look at asteroid material or, 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 or meteoric material that has come from Mars, we know now enough about the geological architecture of Mars to know that that particular meteorite came from Mars. So we can identify these things. So we see these things in objects that have been put together in a manufactured ob uh, object which has some specific purpose. Now, we also find what are called rare earths. 
uh, like uh, thallium and iridium. You don't find those just laying all over the earth. They're very rare, but we find that they're in these objects. So it's a manufactured object that uses this nanotechnology, which is the, the technology, electronic ne technology of the future to d develop electronics on the size of an atom or a multitude of atoms put together to do what they're trying to do now on a computer chip of silicone. The computer chip of silicone is like an elephant in, in comparison to the head of a pin, which you're talking about, you know, in relative size of these objects. But they're able to do more than what the elephant can do in a different fashion. Now, uh, we alluded to the fact that they operate with electrical forces, and until just recently, we figured that they're taking the energy, because we have neuroenergy in our body, and that's, that's what's uh, making the device function. But now we've introduced another theory, and I'll tell you how this came about, that perhaps, you know, what, what we've learned so far, humankind has learned, that energy can be transmitted. And we know that these are switchable objects because sometimes they're on and sometimes they're off. So what makes them go on? What makes them go off? We also know that uh, they put out radio waves within certain megahertz and kilohertz frequencies in the FM band. And because I was able to obtain, uh, rather hard to obtain, let's put it that way, chart, we know that these frequencies are used for fixed or mobile deep space communication. So now that's quite a conundrum if you think about it, because why would an advanced civilization be using an old-fashioned radio wave to communicate? Not possible. So that presents two possibilities. Either there's a deal that's been made between advanced civilizations and our civilization so that somebody can be piggybacking or listening to the data that's coming out. That's one possibility. The other is that these may be operating on what are called scalar wave frequencies. And we know that scalar waves travel faster than the speed of light. And scalar waves also, like the waves in our electromagnetic spectrum, have harmonics. So when we detect a radio wave coming out of one of these objects, it could be merely the harmonic of a scalar wave. And you say, well, who's working on scalar wave technology? I've never heard of anything like that. But I have found a place, a rather large institution, which I, won't, I can't say who it is, but a very large company, and they have a scalar wave laboratory, and this is exactly uh, what they're experimenting with, with now. And these devices that I'm talking about are talking about our, our communications and, and television and uh, science uh, that may be you know, a thousand years ahead of where we are now. Everything is considered by this company uh, uh, to be uh, not only obsolete that we're using today, but antiquated is the word we were, that they used. Now, was the um, when you've looked at these and dissect these, how many years ago have you was, was your first discovery of one of these pieces? Well, that's a good question. The years fly by uh, <laughs> so uh, so uh, fast. Um, I I started doing this uh, as a challenge uh, and as a joke. Uh, to prove that uh, this was the most uh, nonsensical thing that I've ever heard of in my life. I mean, I could conceive the fact that, you know, we're certainly not the only ones in this vast universe, at least the universe we can see. I can also believe because of the history of what we found on Earth and the, the work, for example, that Jordan Maxwell has done looking into ancient times, that this Earth has been visited over millions of years by advanced civilizations. But to see something flying in our skies and, and even admitting to the fact that could be somebody there driving it from an advanced civilization to the fact that people are being abducted, which at that time really wasn't invoked because the, the organizations like MUFON and mm -hmm. QFOS, they, they weren't accepting <laughs> alien abduction as a reality. You go back to the Betty and Barney Hill case, I mean, that was... You know, one of the famous ones. And then Travis Walton case, 
1975, and then finally Whitley Strieber, and, and then you got people involved like Dr. John Mack from Harvard University, and so there was some serious talk. But even to take that approach where you would accept the fact that humans were being abducted and then <laughs> extend yourself out on the limb that somebody was putting objects in their bodies, which you could find no scar, no sign of, and sometimes no physiological pain, maybe some psychological pain, mm -hmm. but it was absolutely absurd. So when someone showed me, you know, X-rays of, uh, of an object in a toe, of a rather large size, and, and said these are alien implants, I, uh, honest to God, I turned around, and laughed, and walked away. Then the individual I was with uh, coaxed me to come back. And I said, well, you know, we do foot surgery all the time, and we put in uh, metal objects for stabilization of bone, repair of fractures, and so on. This person probably had a, a surgery, and something was left over. Well, he said, well, no, as far as I know, she never had a surgery done. And I said, well, can you prove it? And so he reached into a bag like a pilot's bag uh, and uh, pulled out a whole set of medical records and said, here. And hands them to me. He says, you want to go through the medical records? Because they, these are complete records since childhood. And I said, well, you know, I can't do it now. If you let me take them to my room, I'll go through them. So I did. There was nothing there but about any surgery. So I went back the next day. And I said, well, if you think these are so unusual, why don't you just take them out and see what they are? And he said, well, she would probably like to have that done, but she doesn't have any medical insurance and she doesn't have any money. And I said, well, where does she live? And he says, in Texas. And so like an idiot, but I figured, well, I'll have some fun. I said, I'll tell you what, you get her to California and I'll do the surgery free. No cost. And within the next two weeks, he came up with another case of a gentleman who had a like object in the back of the hand. So I got a general surgeon and general surgeon and myself in 1995 did these first two surgeries. And right from the beginning, we were able to see some things that were rather unusual and shocking. And so I felt a little less like this was a joke, but still not a believer. Now, have you tried to reverse engineer any of this technology where it could be applicable to uh, some of the up-and-coming advances in uh, computers, uh, medicine, things like that? Well, uh, the answer is no, because in order to reverse engineer something, you have to understand how it works in the first place. So that's the stage that we're in now. However, uh, we find that there is a, a stage of metallurgy that doesn't exist on the earth. Now, we don't know how they do it. But if you look at the development of the organic casing, the exterior casing of the material is organic material, there is a phase in which the inorganic metal becomes organic. Almost like a becoming a living cell. Right. You start with something that's inorganic, you know, totally, again, on a nanotechnological level, and some something occurs, some reaction occurs, and this actually becomes living tissue, uh, which melds with the body, and there's no inflammatory or rejection reaction, so you don't know that it's there. Uh, but there are, there are, most of the individuals that we've operated on have had some conscious memories, as I said, not only of abduction scenario, or long-standing uh, observations of UFOs, but they have also some memories of something being put in. And some of them can sort of half describe the, the uh, instrumentation that's used to put it in. In the beginning, uh, we did not allow anyone to undergo uh, regressive hypnosis. And the main reason for that is that we just didn't want the criticism that we're putting ideas in somebody's head. Correct. But now, after a while, once the surgery is done, if they want to undergo hypnosis, uh, we use a very fine person that's uh, been educated by Bud Hopkins, one of the most famous people in the world here in California. Her name is Yvonne Smith, and she's done a number of these cases and regressed them. And then we get the full memory of not only what the mechanics of putting the objects in, what the instruments looks like, 
look like, but the the whole procedure is how it was done. And then we get you know peripheral information too, what the ship looks like, what the room looks like they were they were in. <laughs> we did uh, one of these on a, uh, a, a retired quote unquote retired unquote unquote mm-hmm. uh, a military naval military intelligence officer. And uh, he blamed the Navy for having this uh, object in his body. Uh, he weighed uh, 200 and some odd pounds, uh, showed us uh, photos and, and uh, data uh, when he joined the Navy Military Intelligence Corps. And when he was discharged, he weighed 98 pounds. And so it was detrimental to his health. So um, uh, we uh, took the object out, and uh, almost immediately he began to uh, regain his health. And then out of the blue, about six months later, I got a call from him, and he said, uh, I want to thank you for removing the object, but uh, I have to confess that I told you a lie. And I said, what was that? And he said, I'm not retired. Well, usually in those scenarios, you're never retired. <laughs> no. <laughs> and uh, we, we can give good examples of that. There's a... Local gal here in the Pacific Palisades claims to have been abducted and has been implanted. In fact, there's one of the history or one of the different discovery channels she's given interviews. Good-looking blonde lady who feels years ago she was abducted and conveys that she has one of these chips in her. She feels like she's never been the same since then. Well, my advice uh, to anyone that uh, may be listening, if they think that they might be involved in the uh, abduction program or if they've had a prolonged sighting of a UFO. David Jacobs, a known psychologist at Temple University, says as far as he's concerned, anyone that's had a prolonged sighting of a UFO could be an abductee. So if that's happened or they have any memories or nightmares or uh, seeing individuals come into the room at night or during the day, you know, and they're interested, number one, to get a just a plain, simple x-ray done, and that's easy to do because uh, you can go to your local friendly chiropractor. Most of them all have 300 milliamp machines. You tell them, look, you know, I was, you know, around some construction. I think I might have gotten something in my leg. Could you take an x-ray? And for a small amount of money, they'll take the x-ray. And once the x-ray has been taken, then get in touch with me. And they can get in touch with me through my website, which is alien scalpel, S C A L P E L dot com. Alien dot com tells you how to get in touch with me. And uh, then we have them send the x rays. We, as I stated, send them to our radiologist, and away we go. But, Doctor, what are these objects for? Well, I'm glad you asked that, Jordan, because uh, we're coming to uh, some new conclusions. If they're putting out some kind of a uh, signal, it's uh, most likely data. Now, if you remember during our own space program, John Glenn, before going into space, complained that he had to swallow implants because mission control needed the physiological data. So they were sending back physiological data. If we look at the alien abduction program worldwide, and it is a worldwide program. I've been in 42 countries in seven years, and it's no different in uh, Africa than it is in the, in the Middle East or the UK or Canada or South America. Uh, the scenario is about the same. And uh, most of it involves the taking of ova and sperm. Now, these guys are not taking ova and sperm because they're on the cooking channel making omelets. <laughs> you know, so what do you do when you take over a sperm? You're involved in some kind of a genetic experiment. So um, we've come up to the theory that the human civilization, uh, as it is, is being genetically manipulated into a much more advanced, much more conscious type of entity. And you can see that in the children. If anybody is listening as children or grandchildren, Oh, it's, Talk to them. It's amazing. And you know, well, you, if you go back in a time, look at Cro-Magnon Man and the evolution of humans over the centuries. Yeah, I think this is probably not the first time it's done. Uh, often I cite uh, the uh, biblical story of the Tower of Babel, and I've discussed this uh, with Jordan. Um, you, you build this tower to make yourself high. 
you know, to, to get in the space, so to speak. And, of course, according to the Bible, it's because they want to get closer to God. Mm -hmm. But in discussing that with people like L.A. Marzulli pointed out to me, maybe that wasn't the case. Maybe they were trying to get, you know, higher in, in space, you know, and didn't have the, the knowledge to do it. So maybe that's what the tower was all about, because maybe there was things flying around and they wanted to, you know, get up there. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the punishment well, by God was to confuse their language. So if you if you if you look at the the opposing aspect of it, if the language was confused because they built the Tower of Babel by punishment of God, then that only leads you to the conclusion that prior to the time of the Tower of Babel, everybody communicated with each other. Well, how did they communicate with each other? Perhaps they communicated telepathically, and since there's no timeline in the ancient literature, there's, there's never any timeline, maybe they came back, genetically manipulated us again, so the only way we could communicate was vocally. And they might have done the same thing with their, our mental abilities to read you know, telepathic communication. Now, uh, just the other day, we had a discussion at uh, Just Cause Studios, the, the media group there, and uh, one of the gentlemen was saying, well, look, you know, we don't have any idea how horrible it would be to be part of a, a society in which you know, have all these thoughts coming into your head and every, you'd be reading everybody's mind all at the same time. Well, the thought of that is, is stupid. It's ridiculous because if you have the ability to mentally communicate with one or two people, what makes anybody think that there's not a switch that can shut it off? So if you look at the book, for example, Evolution's End by Joseph Chilton Pierce, and he talks about idiot savants. These are people that can't feed themselves, they can't dress themselves, they can't live by themselves, they have to do everything, yet one can sit down at a piano and play the most meticulous music, but if you don't turn the page, you'll just play the same thing over again. Another one he, he cites takes wood and carves automobiles out of wood from every country, from every car that's ever been made. Now, how does he know that? Well, jo Joseph Chilton Pierce says it's because there's a switch, like a dip switch used for your you know, garage door opener or whatever. And that switch has been left open. It's not closed. So perhaps uh, in, in races that are in, innately telepathic, they have those switches. If, if uh, you don't want to read my, if I don't want you to read my mind, I just shut it off. So to make statements that, you know, it's all a hive mind and you can't shut anything off is ridiculous. But there are a lot of ridiculous statements out there. And I always like to warn people if, if anyone says that they have all the answers for any part of this subject, put one finger in each ear and run as fast as you can. One quote that says, um, always trust the one who's looking for truth. Don't ever trust the one who's found it. So true. So true. The Sumerians were talking about the alien gods who came down and messed with us. The ancient peoples in the Middle East and Egypt and especially India, especially India, northern India, up in Tibet, they talk about the aliens who came here from other worlds who were uh, messing with our DNA and, and recreating uh, creatures, and so this is a subject that's been around for thousands and thousands of years, and it's got a lot of uh, a lot of baggage with it that um, people don't know, that never been told this stuff, and that's why I think it's so important, especially for now. It's about time we start looking at the fact that we are not on this earth by ourselves. There's so many things I'd like to to bring out. I know Dr. Lear has to go soon. But I've got a couple of quick questions I wanted to ask the doctor, but uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating uh, story about how there is, in fact, alien life forms here that are inter interfacing with humans, and government does not want us to know. And little by little, it's coming out. When people like Steven Spielberg are making movies like... Uh, Close Encounters and uh, and E.T. Uh, and there's God knows there's all kinds of movies coming out of Hollywood about extraterrestrial interfacing with humans. 
So that, that's a, it's a big story, but it's going to come out one day soon. And when it does, it's going to be really frightening to people who have not thought much about this. Tell us a little bit about what you've seen in South America, because some of those stories are truly off the wall. So that that one doctor that you went to visit down, and what was it? Uh, uh, the one that that yeah, the orthopedic surgeon. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, this was a case that happened in uh, 1996, which is uh, not that long ago, uh, in a small town of about 130,000 people in Brazil, uh, in the state of Minas Gerais. Uh, Minas Gerais is a very unusual state because it's a mixture of agriculture and mining. The um, most of the precious gems that uh, come from this area, the area geographically is an area that receives almost no rain. However, the more southern part of the state receives a lot of rain, so agriculture flourishes. Uh, Varchinia was the city where there was a um, a crash of a non-terrestrial uh, vehicle in uh, January of 1996. Uh, was this broadcast around the world? Did we hear about it in the United States? Uh, yes, it was made uh, public knowledge around the world, but in the United States, we were only able to find one article which appeared on the front page of the Wall Street Journal entitled, Stinky Aliens Land in Brazil. And it was kind of a, a tongue-in-cheek article on the first page, but it was continued on one of the back pages, and they told you know, most of the true story. So uh, those that read it in the Wall Street Journal knew about it, but it would never made the news. But it went all over uh, Brazil. Uh, the, there was a, very, a great similarity between Roswell and the Virginia case. The cases had some, some things that kind of drew them together. In other words, the population of both towns knew what was happening. Uh, but what happened in Brazil, Brazil's a slightly different situation because their civil war ended in 1956. So the, the people of Brazil are totally different than a country which hasn't had a civil war in God knows how many years. So they were used to a bunch of jack-booted thugs. So when they came around and told them to shut up, they gave them the finger, <laughs> so to speak. Mm -hmm. So um, there was a lot of witnesses, both military and, uh, and civilian witnesses that came forth. Well, the beings, there was more emphasis placed on the beings than there was the craft that crashed. And uh, the, the craft that crashed, uh, the largest piece of it was uh, about the size of a bus. And uh, a crane was used to pick it up on, uh, on a military uh, truck that was the Army. So the, the Army, the fire department, which is a, um, a military unit in Brazil, were involved, and the military police, which is a separate unit of the military, was involved. So those were the three branches of the military service. Now, what's interesting about this case is that the Brazilian Space Agency was contacted by NORAD, and NORAD informed the Brazilian Space Agency that this thing was coming down, gave them the coordinates and the time. So when this thing actually came around, it flew around. It had the ability to fly around for a while. So a <laughs> farmer in a truck uh, watched the stuff going on, and he said there was a piece that it was missing out of it from the the back end, the rear end, the aft end, whatever you want to call it, and it was trailing a vapor or smoke before it finally crashed into this empty field. So um, he was, the Brazilian army was there almost immediately, and he was told to move. Well, like any good Brazilian, he moved. He just moved around the corner, and he watched mm -hmm. the whole operation. Yeah. So uh, later that day, uh, three young girls saw um, uh, an entity that was kneeling by a brick wall. And uh, these three girls were not uh, in parallel. There was one behind the other. They were coming home from work. And uh, the first one that saw it uh, looked at it, and it was brown in color, oily skin, had three protuberances on top of the head that went from the front to the back, red eyes, and she looked at it, and she said she thought she saw the devil mm. and took off running. And the second girl looked at it again, and she got a better 
look at the entity. She was frightened, too, but not quite as frightened as the first one. She turned around and followed the first girl. The third girl stayed for a little bit longer until the entity turned its head around and looked at her directly in the eyes. And when I interviewed her, she said she knew that was this wasn't an animal. Not, they they see a lot of you know wild animals in uh, mm-hmm. some of the areas of Brazil, and that there was an intelligent being, and that's what she she told me. But some hours later, only about a block and a half away, two young military police officers in a very small jeep-like vehicle saw what we know now is the same entity trying to cross the street. So a young 25-year-old, healthy, epitome of health, military police officer, young, got out of the, out of the uh, vehicle. His name was Marco Eli Sharezi. And he slowly went over to the being, and it made a buzzing sound. And he put his arm around the being. He could see that it was injured. And he guided that being with him back into the vehicle and put him on his lap. No gloves, no protective material, no shield, no nothing. And so they took him to, in in Brazil, what's like a first aid station in the United States. And they said, what in the world are you bringing me? We, We don't even have the capability of normally treating a human being, and you're bringing me this thing. We don't even know what it is. Get them the hell out of here. Hmm. So they took him out, and they took him to a, a, a hospital, which was Hospital Regional, which was in town. Well, Hospital Regional happened to be a hospital that the military base, which was only about 30 miles away, used when they had accidents. So it was not unusual to see military personnel in this hospital. Uh, they cordoned off the surgery area and the maternity area. There was an orthopedic surgeon that was on the staff. He was asked by the military to come with them. And they they took him back into the surgery area. They told him that it was going to be necessary for him to treat this uh, entity. They didn't tell him anything about it, what it was or whatever. They had him uh, scrub, gown, and so on. He walked in the surgery room. The uh, uh, entity was laying on the tra- table covered with a drape sheet. It was small, so he thought, oh, my God, there's a child that's been injured on the base. So he went over to the view screen and looked at the x-ray, uh, x-rays ray x that they had up on the view screen and saw that the bone had little holes in the bone, the called lacuni, Mm -hmm. and this, we we know, makes tremendous strength in the bone. And so he thought, my God, here's a child with, you know, advanced osteoporosis because it has holes in the bone. So then he walked over to the patient, pulled back the drape sheet, and said, oh, my God, this is not a human being. This is not a child, you know, and he had a fractured leg. So he was told not to come out of the room unless they repaired the fracture on this alien being. So the military guys were actually helping this alien being and telling the doctor, fix the leg. Fix the leg and don't come out of the room until it's fixed. You know, we're not telling you what to do or how to do it. Just do it. So uh, he went ahead and and did it. And I had an interview with him and he told me all the intricacies. He didn't even know what to use for an anesthetic. Because he didn't know whether he was going to feel pain or what it was going to do. So um, he uh, went ahead and gave him a local anesthetic because he was afraid to put him out with, with a general. Could have could have killed him. So uh, he went ahead, and when you repair a fracture, uh, the first thing you do is to reapproximate the bone. You take two the two broken ends of the bone, and what you try and do is you get them together as close as you can put the ends together, and then you figure out a way how to stabilize that fracture site with a pin or a screw or a plate or any combination thereof. So he was thinking about what to do. So uh, he went back in after a few minutes, and he tried to separate the bone, and they wouldn't separate. It had already started to heal. And so he he did, you know, he didn't put any fixation in whatsoever. He just kind of sewed the tissues together and closed the wound. And then uh, he told me that the wound was totally healed within 24 hours, as was the fracture. And I said, 
did you have any communication with this being whatsoever? And he says, uh, no verbal communication, but, and this required a bit of coaxing, he said it downloaded what he called thought grams into his head, like somebody hitting him over the head with a rubber hammer. In fact, he had migraine headaches that lasted for two to three weeks. So I said, can you tell me what you know one of these thought grams was? And he said, I'm just going to tell you two small things. He says, number one, he says, they felt sorry for human, the humankind. And they said, well, why did they feel sorry for human beings? And he said, one of, them, one of the reasons is that we could do everything that they could do, but we didn't know how to do it. For example, it would not be necessary for wherever he came from to have a specialized entity or a facility to cure the physical problems of his body, that they'd either do it individually or join and produce any cure of any disease that might have happened to their body. And the, the other reason, which was quite prophetic, that he said he felt sorry for the human race because the human race was entirely detached from its spiritual self. Hmm. And with that, uh, the doctor was allowed to leave the operating room. He told me a lot of things about the blood and bone and so on. I wrote a book on it uh, in English. There's been two books written, one in Portuguese and uh, one in English, also one in French. But um, What's the book's name? The book's called uh, UFO Crash in Brazil. Very simple uh, title for the book. It's uh, available everywhere, Amazon.com or wherever, any major bookstore. But um, the uh, interesting thing is that they, the following day, they took them, the military took them with a military escort out of that hospital. And because the hospital situation in Brazil is located in a residential area, the people who lived across the street were observing what was going on. And they put the entity into a, a truck. And almost immediately, they took them down the street to a larger hospital called Hospital Humanitas. And in 24 hours, the following morning, three trucks pulled up that were rigged with canvas rigging. They pulled back the canvas rigging, and they loaded on three childlike coffins or boxes. And then each truck took off in a different direction. But we know that the body or body of at least one of the entities they captured uh, undergone uh, a pathological autopsy by the uh, very famous German doctor who identified the bones of Mengele mm -hmm. in Brazil. And um, he had discussed this with one or two students, but he said he will never, as long as he lives, ever give out any information on the subject. All the material, the bodies, or whatever was alive was being taken from, uh, from Varginia uh, in a C-5 aircraft to uh, Sao Paulo, transferred to another uh, U.S. military uh, Air Force aircraft and flown back to the United States. And what year again was this? 1996. Unbelievable. And the fact, um, the first alien that, that fixed his leg, did he live? What happened to that alien? No, he was deceased. He left the hospital deceased. Nobody knows why. Uh, the nurses that were interviewed said that when he, en he entered the hospital, he seemed to be in good condition. The doctor uh, that uh, I interviewed, the orthopedic surgeon, said he left the hospital in satisfactory medical condition with all vital signs present. And that's a legal terminology, whether it's in Brazil or what part of the Correct. world. And you don't need to speak Portuguese to discuss medical things. And that's one reason I was able to understand more than the interpreter was able to tell me. But uh, since that point, and I don't want to go too much into the story, but since that time, there's been a lot of changes that have occurred. And uh, we went back and interviewed him a year later, and he denied everything. He said, and he had a pen in his hand, and he began to twist it feverishly and became more and, agitated. And, uh, agitated. And he said, he, he looked at the interpreter, he, he talked to the interpreter, but all the time he was looking at me 
And he said, I'd like to tell the doctor more about the blood and the bone and the brain and other things about them, but it never happened. It never existed. It was a rumor. No such thing happened. Then just recently, within the last eight months, we found out that the two investigators, who were the chief investigators of this case, one was a, uh, an attorney, a plaintiff's attorney, uh, excuse me, a defense attorney for a large industry by the name of Ubejara Rodriguez, who was one of the original investigators on the case, had a room that was twice as big as this with filing cabinets, one after the other, with testimony of military civilian witnesses, drawings, pictures, everything. He came out and said the case never happened. It was all a bunch of rumors. It did not exist. The second investigator, who was really the first investigator on the case, because when it happened, it was on a weekend, and Ubejar Rodriguez was out of town, the first investigator was a well-known researcher in Brazil by the name of Vittorio Pacacini. Vittorio Pacacini, three to four months ago, disappeared. We don't know where he is. His family doesn't know where he is. He's gone. And the people in the city of Virginia, instead of being more terrified, are beginning to, to scream and shout, we are not liars, we know what we saw, and now more witnesses are coming forth because now they've retired from the military and more civilian witnesses are coming forth. So something I predict within the next six months is really going to explode out of Varginia again. Now, A.J. Javard, who is one of the leading uh, researchers in ufology in Brazil, uh, during this same period of time, uh, was uh, summoned to Brasilia, and the Air Force released 2,000 documents of classified material having to do with UFOs. And part of those documents was a big surprise because the, US Air, the uh, Brazilian Air Force was also surveying Virginia because of the high amount of UFO activity that was over that area. Oh, and there's a lot more to Dr. Lear than meets the eye. But um, uh, would you be up to talk about that doctor that had the museum? Oh, uh, you're talking about the Ica Stones in yeah, Peru. Yeah, yeah. that was a very uh, interesting experience, Jordan, because um, in Peru, uh, almost anywhere you can uh, buy these uh, small little stones in which uh, uh, carvers had made you know, various carvings, and they're selling them as uh, what are called the Ica Stones. Now, the, the city uh, is Ica, uh, Peru. And it's a, it's, a, it's a small town. But there was a, an amateur archaeologist who was also a physician there, and uh, his son was training to be an archaeologist. And they were out one day in a stream bed, and he noticed a dry stream bed. And he noticed that in one area, the sand was pouring through like a, a funnel uh, into the ground. So they found that quite interesting. So they started an excavation site, and below the stream bed was a series of tunnels. And they finally got into these tunnels, and they found 11,000 stones of varying size, some of them maybe as big as a walnut, to some of them as big as this room. And uh, all the stones had uh, depictions on them. Uh, they were a magnetite type of a stone, but they were covered with a mortar. And then a picture was depressed into the mortar. And these, these pictures showed a civilization that was living with dinosaurs in which they had modern technology that they were using. For example, telescopes looking at the stars, uh, surgeries that were going on, C-sections with um, uh, individual patients that had look like sticks or rods going in through the nose for anesthesia and numerous other things. They had uh, children who were playing with the small type of dinosaurs that we haven't seen yet, uh, have, ne have never been found, uh, using them as pets. Uh, but some of the other dinosaurs, like the Tyrannosaurus and things that we know, were, were also there. So they had this um, these stones uh, looked at at the uh, University of Lima, and they dated them back to a million years ago. And there was some discussion about the accuracy of that 
find. So they sent uh, some replicas of these stones, actual stones, to Bonn, Germany, and a university of Bonn, Germany, dated them back to between one and three million years ago. So here was a civilization, highly advanced civilization, millions of years ago that were, were there. So if, as, as Jordan knows m much better than I do, if we look at the history of this planet, we see over and over and over again telltale remnants where uh, advanced civilizations have been here and gone. And if we look at some of the conundrums that we find, for example, the Incas, where are the bones of the Incas? Where are the bones of the Maya? Where are the bones of the Aztecs? We know where the bones of the American Indians are. And I've been to uh, Guatemala, spent two, two weeks in the jungle at Tikal. And when you talk to some of the Indians there, they say they are the Maya, but they're not the Maya. There's no bones. There's nothing left. So where did these civilizations go? Yet in the stream beds of Peru, there are skulls laying around like rocks. And these, some of these skulls are skulls in which the cephalic portion or the top of the head have been elongated. Like and, and, and it's not cradle boarding because the, we saw the instruments that they use for cradle boarding. They don't fit these skulls, yet there's lots of them. We found other skulls that we call mushroom heads where the, the head is, is squashed down and the eye sockets are deeper. We just recently saw, and I have photos of another skull that was found. There's, we have two bones in our skull on the sides. They're called parietal bones, and they come together with a, a suture or a line where they connect. This skull had only one parietal bone and weighed more than the other skulls, even the ones with the elongated uh, heads. And as uh, Jordan pointed out, through uh, you know various uh, historical findings and dress and so on, I think wasn't it the the dress of the uh, the, uh, the palace in uh, the UK in which the palace guards absolutely the wore, palace guards uh, yeah well, what kind of headdress <coughs> were they wearing the same identical shape heads that the uh, palace guards in, in the UK have is the same identical head uh, heads of these ancient alien uh, skulls. and uh, But one of them actually had some uh, hair on this skull that was found in South America, and it was black hair. Well, when you see the, 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 the uh, headdress of these guards at, at, uh, in England. Like a Buckingham uh, Palace right, guarding exactly. the palace for the Precisely. queen. Precisely. Mm -hmm. That's <clears throat> that I saw immediately. Why are those guards wearing those strange headdresses, those large, well, because they're elongated heads, and we now know that there were alien life forms or some other kind of life forms that are not human that had those kind of heads, long, elongated heads. And to tell me that you smash a baby's head and it grows that way, no, there is not enough mass in the, in the, in the, the bone of the child's head to make that much mass i mean there's just too much mass in that in that skull it's yeah i've seen photos day. of them the photos yeah. of those uh skulls i've yeah, seen well, images we've, of them we've, yes. lo we've looked at the instruments that they use for cradle boarding and they don't fit these heads at correct, all that's correct. right yep. so uh another little tip that that uh, nobody knows about yet except me and two other people we just i just got a sample of the hair from one of these elongated heads. Oh, it's a, really? It's a black hair. Oh, really? And we're uh, just uh, turned it over to uh, Steve, our head scientist, and we're going to look first of all to see what the color is made of, whether they dyed the hair black, whether it's naturally black, whether it's in the medullary canal, or whether it's in the lamella of the hair itself. Then we have another specimen company coming that's got the hair bulbs. Hmm. from the head so we can go ahead and now with modern dna techniques we can actually look at the dna and so, match it if human or non-human or yeah human or non-human or maybe both characteristics we can find human and non-human so all of this we're talking about is the mere fact that there is alien life forms on this earth that have been here for millions of years they're here right now 
There's no doubt about that. They're here right now among us. We have just been, uh, you know, we've been led astray by our governments and religions who tell us there's nothing to it, so don't worry about it. That's what my, my, that's what my dad used to tell me. You know, if I, I saw something going on in the house, he says, none of your business, don't worry about it, it's not important. Now I look back on that and I say, no, no, he didn't want me to know what was going oh, on. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, I think maybe uh, in closing uh, remarks, we, we, I think we all agree, you know, Jordan and I definitely agree, that there is some, whatever you want to call it, non-terrestrial influence, some, some uh, intelligence, or whatever it, it is, that not only runs the function of this planet, but perhaps the solar system and maybe a portion of the universe or maybe the whole shebang. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I recently learned that uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was Lawrence Livermore Laboratory removed all the particles from the nucleus of an atom. And when they looked in, do you know what they saw? An infinite amount of geometric patterns. Poss yeah, possibilities as well. Yeah. So are we a matrix? Do we exist only because we exist in the mind of another intelligence? Ponder that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's fascinating. Do you, uh, do you want to talk about the, the crabs that were found, those two little crabs, or do you want to talk about that another time? Uh, I think we should talk about it another time. There's been two little uh, tiny aliens, though, <coughs> that have been found that are only about six inches long. Oh, yes. Oh, I heard about that. Yeah, yes. and that, that work is going on now, and uh, they don't know what they are, but they are uh, bona fide organic tissue. And uh, last I heard, the estimated age was uh, perhaps uh, six weeks old. But they are only about six inches long, mm -hmm. and they're they're doing DNA testing as we speak. That's fascinating. Also, I'd love to have you, you know, at our next visit or whenever you have a chance to share that story we discussed at uh, lunch over the uh, French archaeologist. Oh yes, yes, that's uh, one of the most uh, interesting uh, stories there is, and there's quite a relationship between uh, what we heard from that. Uh, archaeologist and what, the subject that we're just talking about, but uh, again, you know, there's some control, and and the things that are going on on Earth today, you know, if if someone is highly advanced and can travel into the future or can travel into the past or control the future and the past. I mean, you you got to admit that we're all under certain control. All you got to do is look around today and and put that together with the children that we've been talking about, the abduction phenomena, the things that are happening in the world today, uh, generated by individuals that are less than 35 years of age, using the electronic power that we have in the Internet, the things that are going on with the military in Red China, uh, the hacking, all, all the other stuff that's going on, the, what, what people, the average person is finding out about the world banking system, which Joe Jordan is an authority on. You know, uh, the average person now is asking questions. You know, they're looking on the Internet. They're listening to shows such as this one. Mm -hmm. And they're listening all over the world. So, you know, this this is an awakening process and the world is in a state of flux and change, but is there still control from the outside? Oh, well, you can bet on it. Absolutely. Maybe, you know, like everything we know scientifically, and I come from a scientific background, everything we know about the universe is in balance. So if everything is in balance, balance even on the theological aspect of it, you know, there's the light and then there's the dark. You can't tell which one came first. But those are forces of good and evil. Perhaps we've been in a situation in which the dark forces have been running the show for X period of time, and maybe there's even a war going on as we speak at this moment, which may allow the light, the forces of light, to completely change the earth and mankind back into what Jordan describes as the paradise, which was described Eden. in— Eden. Yeah. 
in the, yeah. in the early... Because whoever well, it was that created us, the gods who created us, whoever created us, obviously had a reason and had a motive, and now to see their family that they created, to see your children, your offspring, or whoever it was, you know, you're, you're seeing your family being desecrated, being destroyed with, uh, with the chemtrails and murder and violence and drugging, and someone's trying to destroy the whole human race and keep everyone fighting and murdering each other. So whoever created us has got a, 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 a part in this to watch what's going on here, to what they have created. And I would be a bit surprised if they're going to make a move on this earth to protect their creation. What they have created, they're watching right now that creation being destroyed. And uh, so I think it's an idea as time has come to talk about these ideas that we are the product of of a higher civilization, of a higher whatever we call God. Uh, and I think that something is going to happen soon on the earth to show us that we are not alone in this universe. I want to thank you, Dr. Lear, for being here with us. And there's a lot more we could talk about later. But I want to thank you because it's an extraordinary uh, subject of how humans are having implants put in them and it's people like Dr. Lear who's taking them out and finding out that they are electrically, that they have a reason for being put in the body, and somebody highly intelligent is able to put it into the body, and the body won't see it. So what a, what a hell of a story it is. Yeah, Dr. Lear, it has been a pleasure. Thank you so much thank for you your for time. Being and, here. Yeah, God well, bless. Thank, thank you for inviting me, and it's a pleasure being here and participating in the show and uh, um, if we get calls, why, um, I'll be very excited. Yeah, yeah, we're really looking forward to you coming back to it. Okay. want to share that story at lunch. <laughs> okay. And we'll promote your, your website on our, on our website. We're going to promote your website and your books and where to get them and all of that. Dr. Roger Lear, L-E-I-R, go on the web, check him out. A lot of material on there for Roger Lear. Thank you, doctor. You're welcome. So this is pretty much the end of the show. So, uh, but, but before we go, uh, I'll leave you with this. Chris Carter, the producer of X-Files. Interesting stories about Chris Carter. I, I, well, you know him, don't you? No, I don't know him, but I, I know people who do know him very well. But anyway, Chris Carter, his birthday is 10 uh, the month of 10, 13th of the month. Uh, which what would that be? October thirteenth yeah. is his birthday. If you get uh, the music track from X Files, uh, at the end of the last song, I bought it and I was writing and I was working in my office. So I was just listening to all the different cuts on the album. And when it gets to the last, the very last song, normally uh, your uh, player your stereo will shut off automatically. But if the, uh, in the studio, when it was originally being laid down, the music was originally being laid down, if the, uh, if the studio does not shut the key off, it continues to be a live feed, but there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. And it's a live feed, but you don't know it because the last song has gone off, so you think the, the stereo shut off. It didn't shut off. There's still a live feed and it's going somewhere. And so if you look on the counter, on your little counter on your mm -hmm. computer, wait till it hits 1013. His birthday. His birthday. And when it hits 1013, I was working and I had forgotten all about the music was off and I forgot all about it. All of a sudden, bam, it comes on and scared me to death. I was not expecting it. All of a sudden comes on this guy talking about aliens, underground bases, and it was scary. And it comes on at exactly 1013, Chris Carter's birthday. And he put that in there knowing nobody's ever going to listen to this. Nobody's ever going to hear this. But if they do, it's going to scare them out of their pants. And I'm telling you. It's really scary listening to this because what's being said, Chris Carter obviously knew something he wasn't supposed to know, and he put it in this recording. So you, you, you get the music from X-Files and run it through to the last song. At the end of the last song, 
forward speed, forward, fast forward till you get to the 10, and then stop at 10 and let it play from 10 on because I'm 10 2, 10 3, 10 4, 10 5, and when it hits 10 13, listen what comes on and listen to the words that this guy is telling you because I'm telling you, he's telling you the exact truth about the aliens, the U.S. government, and what they're really doing. And Chris Carter slipped it in in a way that you would never even know it was there unless you, like me, you didn't turn your recorder off. You thought it automatically went off, but it didn't. So tonight I want to leave you with what Chris Carter did at the number of 1013, which is birthday. I want you to hear what was on there that you never heard before. So maybe we can roll that. The method, as they call it, though it was more so a germline procedure of singular metascientific complexity, had been given to them by the alien colonists as a quid pro quo. The syndicate would help them to create a population of alien hybrids who would hide in plain sight, cloned from human ova and alien biomaterial. So there would be a clone race immune to the effects of the black oil when the return to the planet began. For this, the syndicate would be sequestered, granted a sort of immunity or asylum, given a place in the grander scheme. They were the Vichy government to the German final solution, collaborationists whose motivation was simple, self-directed survival. These cloning operations were spread across the country, the cataloging and record-keeping done through a complex intra-institutional system that connected to every branch of government from the Social Security Administration to the Department of Defense. The operation, under the working title Purity Control, had been launched in 1948, its original conception the brainchild of German scientists given immunity themselves from war crimes and allowed to continue the eugenic experiments that were Hitler's dark legacy. The syndicate had begun as a subset of a shadow intelligence agency whose original orders were to create plausible denial and an effective cover-up of purity control. But through 50 years, numerous U.S. and U.N. administrations, the principles began to wrest control, accumulating power and influence across international borders. Such that by 1990, the operation ceased to have a member accountable to any one government, and whose only orders would be taken from a man named Struggold, a German industrialist who had fled his homeland to Northern Africa. These men, whose knowledge and access provided control of a foreseeable future, had in spite of this everything to lose. Their secret work, the cloning preparations and the cataloging, constituted their greatest vulnerability, exposure. Their detection would ensure not just their own demise, but a far-reaching dissolution of social and religious order around the globe. To protect against this, the syndicate employed methods of disinformation using covert government programs that had been regrettably discovered as a kind of smokescreen. A dodge or blind where the transgressions of Congress accountable agencies served to hide their own more odious undertaking. They had even at times used the UFO phenomenon to create an hysteria that science and the intelligence had denounced so completely as to make belief and believers seem ridiculous and completely discreditable. They had also, in a crisis, used a tool of the colonists themselves alien bounty hunters who policed the cloning operations and enforced rule on the countdown to colonization. A double-edged sword whose cold-blooded tactics could help to stem a leak or threat, but who also kept a watch on the syndicate. A threat in itself, as the syndicate had something to hide that not even the colonists knew of, a vaccine against the black oil, an inoculant against the substance in which the alien life force was held, in fact, the very medium of the life force itself. To guard this secret was perhaps even more critical than the truth of the existence of alien life and of colonization. If the syndicate's own secret vaccine were discovered, a vaccine that would make themselves immune from the effects of the black oil, they would certainly be destroyed and the timetable for colonization stepped up. They would protect this secret with their lives. They would kill to protect it, as it symbolized the only hope they had of avoiding enslavement when the planet was overtaken. That they had been able to, over decades, conduct their work on the vaccine undetected was a result of a code among the syndicate members that put honor and the future above personal politics. But now this code was beginning to break down, an incipient scramble for power beginning to develop, a threat from within that doubled the threat from without. So that's, that's, um, this is Chris Carter's project of explaining to the world what's really going on 
behind the scenes but with our government and the aliens and the Illuminati, the bastards of this world who run this world, who they are and what they're doing and how this stuff is really working, how this stuff really works, the Illuminati's connection to the extraterrestrial knowledge, wisdom and understanding and technology in relation to their extraterrestrial, their control over our government, over our lives, and how they are playing us for fools and how the government has no opportunity to do anything. They must go along with it because it's a superior race, a superior civilization that is over us, and we know we can't defeat them, so you better sue for peace and just go along with what they want because they are superior, and you know it and I know it. What politicians and what corporations are being run by the, by the Russian mafia in America? Uh, what corporations are owned by and run by the Chinese mafia, the, the Tong Society? You start looking into the mafia, the underworld, the Cosa Nostra, uh, to the Middle Eastern uh, has, uh, assassins, Knights Templars, you're going to really find some stuff there you don't want to know about.